and thank you for joining the corporate track. So before I start, I'd like to have a show of hands. Who here is brand new to gamification? Okay, great. Who here has done maybe a few projects, knows a little bit? Great. And any fellow experts? I know at least two, yes. <laughs> fellow speakers, fellow experts. So we know we have a lot of ground to cover. So. My background, if you hear a multitude of accents, you're absolutely right. I'm, I'm originally from Belgium. I live partly in Sweden, partly in the UK. So if you hear a mix, that's where it comes from. <laughs> so like, that gets people really confused. So I'd like to start with a bit of a working definition for today, uh, based on how I would define gamification so that we have some common ground and some common uh, ways of working. So let's test my technical skills. Yes, it worked. <laughs> um, so in my book, gamification is the application of game dynamics, game psychology, and game mechanics to non-game situations. Now, I would also say to most of my clients, it's 80% psychology, and then the rest are mechanics and dynamics. And that's important from the corporate perspective because a lot of people come shopping for a game. And then when you sort of don't let them play any games or touch game mechanics until way later, they get frustrated. So it's important to note. So what's the difference between a mechanic and a dynamic? So for example, a leaderboard is a mechanic. The dynamic that introduces by default is competition. A social share button is the mechanic. What does that ask you to do straight away? Collaborate, exactly. So, so that's the fine difference between mechanic and dynamic. By introducing one, you by default introduce the other. And I always make, uh, make sure that people understand the difference and that actually some mechanics don't belong in certain places. For example, a leaderboard in my book, I'd work a lot with learning related gamification, does not belong in learning. Personal opinion. <laughs> uh, not every gamification platform under the sun agrees with me. But actually, I think from a learning perspective, the only leaderboard you should have is a content leaderboard where people who have taken the content rate your content. People leaderboards in learning actually are only motivational for the top two or three people. Everybody else thinks they're dummies. As an average learner in school, in the, the nerdy kid class, I was bottom of the pile usually, but in my year, I was in the top 10% but I always felt like a dummy. How does that make your people feel? And that's not what we're trying to do when we're actually encouraging learning in the workplace. So think about these things. And if you have a platform that encourages you to use a leaderboard, say, well, we want it on content, thank you very much. <laughs> and if they have a problem, tell them to talk to me. I can help them switch it off. <laughs> there is an off button usually. So where have you potentially being gamified because most people think, oh, I've never played a game, I'm not into games, but you know, actually, who's on LinkedIn? Yeah, we've got 90% take up on that one. So where you've likely been gamified is with this little progress bar. The progress bar was introduced and actually made us all beaver away and fill out our profiles. Because guess what? LinkedIn is nothing without complete profiles. So they had a very good business reason to introduce that game mechanic. Now that game mechanic works because we have been conditioned by school that 0% is not so good, 100% is really great. And they showed us really fantastic first uh, or change management approach they, so, they also show us 
you get plus 5% if you fill in that section. You get plus 20% if you fill in that section. From a change management perspective, giving people the first next step is ideal. So that's what made people increase their profile completion by something like 60%. I mean, anyone in HR needs forms filled? Yeah. Nah, I, I keep saying that and I don't see many progress bars in work offices. <laughs> but, you know, it's a simple mechanic. Now, they have a few other mechanics in, in the pack. So we, most of us like a bit of peer recognition. So how many people viewed my profile? Uh, if you're posting anything, how many people actually liked your stuff? It's something we do. It's something all of the social media channels have down, like, amazingly. But has your Word or Office or ERP system asked you that question recently? I guess not, right? <laughs> so that's a lot of the work that I, I focus on with, with the corporate sector, is how can we make our tools much more engaging, much more user-friendly, but also fit for purpose? So what LinkedIn needed was complete profiles or they had nothing to sell. So that's their business reason for introducing gamification. What's your business reason for introducing gamification? That would be my first question to you. Now, what can it do? So giving uh, some, some statistics, because I know some of you might need to build a business case for it. Uh, gamification and employee engagement, according to the Aberdeen group, they said, actually, if we employ gamification, the employee turnover comes down. So that is people leaving the job uh, comes down by a significant 36%. If uh, you measure engagement, now engagement is a big measurement. So um, it's measured on their employee engagement surveys. They said, if you introduce gamification, you have the potential for engagement to go up 48%. Anecdotally, from my own clients, I can tell you that if the starting point is zero, 50% increase in engagement is possible. So you're starting with a blank sheet, not so great situation, maybe nothing in place, 50% is achievable. If, uh, for example, you already have a very good uh, employee engagement strategy in place, then nudging it over towards 20% increase is realistic. So I'm not talking massive numbers, I'm talking small numbers. But if you think about it, McDonald's, for example, introduced a till game to get their actual people working on the tills quicker, faster. That made a 1% decrease in the lines on the till on their bottom line, that actually means many more people can, find, can buy burgers and chips. So for their business, it was a good decision, right? So even small percentages can make a big impact. So don't get hung up on, on the numbers, but do measure them. Because I do prefer data-driven design than I like finger in the air. Yeah, we think it's working. <laughs> okay. So, but these are some of the things. So this was Aberdeen Group on a sample of mainly Western companies. So uh, both UK, US, uh, Western uh, related companies. Now, Dale Carnegie focused mainly on American and North American companies. And they said actually employee engagement, if you have an engaged workforce, we outperform the companies that don't have an engaged workforce by 202%. Now, that's impressive. Now, I like big numbers, but employee engagement is not an easy one to tackle. It's a vast minefield. So you want to do that bit by bit and see where can you actually break it down and have the biggest impact. Now, my mission today is to give you something to walk away from that is actionable straight away when you go back to work tomorrow. So that's my mission. I also make it my mission to make it interactive. So I will require participation. And you will be the first of all of the groups 
to experience the gamification design deck in person. So it should be fun, <laughs> right? So what are the most common reasons to do gamification? In fact, there's a few wrong ones. So uh, Carl Kapp, who's heard of Carl Kapp? Yes, he's a professor in the, in the US, talks a lot about learning related gamification. And he, he made a study and he said, well, actually, there are some wrong reasons. These are the wrong reasons. He says, if it's cool, it's awesome, people are going to love it, everybody loves games, everybody loves gamification, and it's easy. Come again. <laughs> Who here loves games? Good. Who here doesn't really like games? Yeah, there's always a few. And that's okay. So we want to make our games inclusive without pushing the people who hate games away from us. I also, biggest criticism in the corporate sector, ooh, are my people going to be playing all the time? We're a serious business, we can't possibly introduce fun. It's probably the most common objection I face. And the reality is, yeah, sometimes we have to turn systems off, but it's rare. It's rare. It happens once in a blue moon. What I also hear a lot, oh, we need gamification for the millennials and Generation Z. Who thinks that? Good. <laughs> You're quite an educated audience. So the millennials and Generation Z are growing up with games as a default. They play games, they know games. Some of them think books should go like this. <laughs> okay, my niece who's, uh, who's three tried um, to play with the book and didn't work like the iPad did, <laughs> so, which was quite funny. But, you know, they grow up with game mechanics in everything that they do. For them, it's business as usual. Is Generation X and the generations before the baby boomers who actually are the ones that get hooked on workplace gamification systems? In fact, in one client, we've had to turn off the system during working hours because Generation X was on it too much. They're the 30, 40 somethings in the rooms. <laughs> so, you know, we're all, we all have that inner child at heart. Now, what are the right reasons to implement gamification? If you want to create interaction, it's useful. If you want to create engagement, it's a good reason. If you're uh, trying to overcome disengagement, so the disengaged employee, you can hear at the water cooler or in the coffee station, so sort of saying, yeah, I hate this company, I don't like it, I'd like to go for another job. They're actively doing things to damage your brand and your organization. But if you ask them, they won't tell you. Because, gosh, they could lose their job, right? So, they do work, but only as little as they can get away with. So watch out for them. They're your disengaged guys. Uh, you want to provide opportunities for deep thought and reflection. Now, good games make you think, make you take new strategies, make you try out new things. Good gamification should do the same thing. Superficial gamification, yeah, it's nice. It's like icing on the cake, but you need a good cake, right? My theory is always start with good cake and then make it fancy. So, um, so you should have deep thought reflection. It should change behavior for the better. So gamification in my book should reinforce the behavior you want more of, not what you want less of. A little bit like cognitive behavioral therapy, where you reward the good things and you don't focus on the negatives, right? So that's where your psychology comes in. And you want authentic practice where I can be me, my real me, and behave like my real me. Not where I have to wear some other role mask or face mask that I step into some other persona to make something work for me. So you wanted to allow people to be themselves. Now, where does it apply in the gamification or in the employee experience? Pretty much anywhere. Anywhere where you have a process. So 
I know it's a tiny, tiny writing. So I have employer branding, recruitment, assessment, well-being, onboarding, productivity, job rotation, job enrichment, job mastery, performance, exit, and promotions. Now, I work a lot in the area of job design, in the area of learning, onboarding, recruitment. All of the things that are processes in an organization are potentially gamifiable. If the process is broken, also fix the process before you add game mechanics. Because adding game mechanics to a broken process multiplies the frustration by a high number. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Okay. So where is employee engagement at? Actually, it's quite shocking across the world. Every country has numbers that are not necessarily so good. Depending on the source, they'll vary, but it's not a rosy picture. Who here is maybe thinking about employee engagement and gamification? Yeah, a few of you, yeah. And you're not alone. It's probably our most common request in terms of business. Now, today's employees are very savvy. They're technologically on, they know what to do, they grew up with social media, games, sharing, chats, and they'll expect their work systems to be the same. But most of our work systems were designed in the 50s for the manufacturing industry. And they have ugly interfaces. <laughs> so we come from having these wonderful apps on our mobiles and then we go into work and we get this lovely, boxy, ugly looking form <laughs> thingy. <laughs> you know, so there is a disconnect. So it, it doesn't make, it makes sense. So gamification is not just about people, but also about the softwares we use. So, and we see a trend that's changing. So uh, in the earlier days, we had tools that track and man manage and administer compliance. So who's in the holidays, the, the work type of, related measures. Uh, now we have talent management systems who basically track where people are going. Uh, what's coming is engagement type systems where we're actually looking to implement systems that actually empower and connect people. But the next level up is productivity. Now, these are findings from uh, Bursin, from Deloitte. And Josh Bursin this year said that in HR, the gamification of HR is really topical. So it's no surprise that I get asked a lot to speak about gamification to these kinds of audiences. So the software that we're using is allowing us to do more. Now, in the end of the day, gamification is about the people, people and the people using it. So we want to incorporate health, fitness, well-being, and sustainable performance over the long track. That's not easy to achieve. But if we look at those Fitbits and all sorts of trackers that we wear, we have information and people actively engage, engaging in gamified processes without us needing to tell them to do so. They already do it. Who here has a Fitbit or a tracker of some, yep, <laughs> some proud wearers <laughs> showing them off? You know, so these things are around. Now, what does that mean for the workplace? Well, we could actually end up in the name of employee engagement with a whole bunch of systems, right? So you need something that ties them together. And in my perspective, you need a good strategy. You need a strategy that makes sense so that these tools actually make sense to you, but also to your employees. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. So let's apply some game design thinking to employee engagement. So I need a first volunteer uh, who has maybe a problem that we're trying to address. So anyone with a problem they're trying to address in the workplace? We have a program uh, to training program for senior executives mm -hmm. and uh, it's a two day workshop and we want to continue the engagement, uh, build on their takeaways, that kind of thing. So I'm seeing gamification as, um, um, 
I guess we were thinking of a lead board. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I don't think we will now. We'll okay, go that's more good. With that's the, fantastic yeah. takeaway. You already <laughs> accomplished my mission, so that's good. <laughs> that's good. But yes, let's work on that. So you have a, an executive training and you want it to be reinforced after they leave the training. Great. So would you mind coming up and helping me? Uh, so in the gamification card deck, that if you tweet a lot, you are potentially able to win. So what I want you to do, perfect. So we have different color cards. So there's three different color types of types of people. I have learner types, customer types, and employee types. There is no science attached. They're just people I've met in different offices around the world. So what I want you to do, because we're talking about learning, have a look through the learning deck and pick the one profile that you think your executives are most like. So take your time. So what, what I'm doing here is shortcutting what in, let's say, the corporate world, I would do through surveys, questionnaires, observations. But because we don't have all of her people here, we can't do that right now. So I'm helping you shortcut, but showing you that actually this is an important part. Required. So they're, they have to do training. So these cards are all based on the motivation behind um, the training that they need to do. So it's, we must do this training. It's not up, not up to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Awesome. So that's the first thing we, we need to know, because people that have to train have a different motivation than people that choose to train. So we have to keep that in mind. If, and I'm, I'm just guessing, is it also linked to performance management indicators? Yeah, <laughs> I thought it would. So required to train and then required to track. So that's an interesting combination. So it's a great problem, by the way. I like it. Now, where do I leave the clicker? So when I started designing for gamification, so my background, I worked in change management. I worked in learning and development. I was a learning and development manager inside a corporate sector and a learning designer. So I've I sort of covered the spectrum of anything to do with training HR that involved making people move from where they were to where they needed to be for a corporate reason. So that's pretty much where I come from. When I, I, I also wanted to be a game designer when I was seven. <laughs> My dad said there was no, no, buy, no money in games, so get a real job. <laughs> you know, so I, I did make crosswords for older people, so puzzles are my thing. Um, I nearly missed some of my final exams thanks to SimCity and my city going on fire. So, you know, there's, there's all sorts of game stories all the way through, through my life. So it was no surprise that I used games to do what I did and to achieve results. Because when I talked to people, that was the common thing that I always found. So I would, you know, in change management projects, go to the canteen, have chats. I was like, you know, did you realize it also can do this? And then I would watch how long it would take before the rumor came back to me in its new shape. It usually took two weeks on average in a big organization. So when I started in gamification, I basically found out that certain things worked and certain things didn't. So I started to build frameworks to help me do it right. Uh, so the first thing I always say is we need business specifics. So if you don't have business specifics, then my question is why? Why are you doing it? So for leadership training to work, of course, good leaders motivate good people. So it's a good business reason. For leaders to have good practices is a good reason. But sending them to training is not enough. So you need proof of their learning in action. So that would be what I would measure in the case of your project. Proof of actually applying what they've learned. And I would even set a quest to sort of spread out what they would do over a period of time, okay? So that would be how I would measure, are we achieving what we're setting out to do? The second thing, and it's also a non-negotiable if you're working with me, is we need to understand the players. So we need to do some research about 
what are the personas like that are taking these courses. Skip this step at your peril, right? Because if you don't understand what really motivates people and you're applying game mechanics, you're going to get it wrong 90% of the time. I mean, I recently, yes? It's very vivid, um, and you, you may be getting to this. Uh, this is where I was getting tripped up, is applying game mechanics to qualitative uh, performance. Uh, as opposed to, it, it seems a lot. It seems a lot of well, it seems a lot of it is connected to uh, uh, KPIs and quantitative measurements. Mm -hmm. So some of these measures can be qualitative measures, you know. And if it is to drive qualitative performance, absolutely make sure you have qualitative measures in there. But you should be able to measure it because you do want to see improvement. So if the quality of, let's say, if we ask the leaders to do regular meetings, but the meetings are really bad, the people will tell you. You know, the rest of the team will say, oh gosh, we'll have another one. So you want to then find those softer measures. So it's not always hard numbers. It can be a lot of softer input. So absolutely. Great question. Thank you. So you do want to know what drives people. And only then, when we have the first two down, will I actually go to game design. So there's a whole bunch of time that passes before we get there, which annoys corporate teams. <laughs> but we get them there. OK, so the other question I get asked a lot, can it be gamified? If it's a person, who thinks a person can be gamified? Good. Thank you. <laughs> the only person that can decide to be gamified is that person themselves. If you are doing it to them, oh, don't, don't, don't go there. It's like manipulation. It's like a really bad practice. However, if it's a process, totally acceptable to do gamification with. Okay? I've often had people in workshops say, oh, I hate my boss. Can we gamify the boss? <laughs> and I usually say no. <laughs> you can gamify yourself to do better according to your boss's standards, but gamifying your boss is not a good idea. You know, so, so these things. So you also want to make sure that you have control over it or that at the minimum you can influence the process because uh, otherwise you're gamifying something you can't actually change. You want to measure how successful it is. So what are the objectives? How are they currently measured? And is that how they should be measured in the future? Because current state and future state are often different. I worked on a large change management project for a, a, a retail company. They wanted to go from product focus to customer focus, but they didn't change their reporting initially. And guess what? People didn't change their behavior. Why would you? You're still measured on old school measures. Okay, so, so we had to change the reporting to actually get the effect we wanted. Um, so you want to answer those questions. Now, in the case of uh, the leadership problem we're working on, so they've been to training. So what happens after they've been to training? Sorry, I'm <laughs> relying on a little bit of, of extra input. Only share what you're allowed to share. So there's a follow-up with um, the senior executives at 30 days to see how they're doing and that kind of thing. So it's a formal meeting or of some kind? Yes. Yep. Anything yeah. else? Uh, there's a whole series of activities that go on that they have to report back how okay. they're doing. Great. So you don't just leave the training room and say, happy days, job done. There is actually a task list and then some actions that they need to take. That's right. And it's that tax, task list that we're trying to continue. Like It's building the buzz to keep it going, keep it alive. Exactly. Because they come out buzzed. Pardon me? They come out of the training buzz. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's simulated learning and a host at a table that encourages them and that kind of thing. Awesome. Thank you. You buy, by the way, you, you're earning yourself a gamification deck, so it's, <laughs> you'll walk away with some tools. <laughs> so, so, so yeah, so what we would do is we would map out all of the specific steps attached to that process. 
And then we go looking, where are the meaningful touch points? Where are the places where they could potentially drop off? Where are the points where most people, so the first day back, you probably, if you're a leader, have an inbox of about 5,000 emails waiting for you. And going, <laughs> I love to do people management, but I can't. My inbox is killing me. Anyone ever been there? Yeah, there's a few of you. <laughs> Recognize that. Fine. <laughs> you know, it happens to me when I travel and you're in the wrong time zone. You can do nothing about it. You know, the thing is, the business doesn't die if you don't answer today. As long as you answer, eventually. But, you know, we, this 24-7 mentality means certain things. But those are the meaningful touch points where people could potentially drop off the great intention that they had at the end of a leadership training session. I used to deliver a lot of leadership training and we, we spread out the days. And the amount of times people came back on the second session and said, yeah, I, I had great intentions, but it didn't happen because, you know, that department needed this. We had a rush on that and such a crisis happened. It's business as usual, right? So we need to set it so we, we help them to succeed and we stop them from falling off the bandwagon. Now, there's a few things that we can do. Duolingo, the language learning app, has a winning streak, so a login streak for it. So Duolingo is a free app. If you, who has heard of it? There's a few nods, so I know if you, if you haven't, it's free to download, try it. The, the login streak, the longest login streak that they have running is seven years. Yeah. That was exactly my response, seven years. Now they have no, or they make no qualms about the fact that to learn a language, you need to practice a little every day. So that's their objective. So that's why that login streak is important. To be a good leader, should you spend time with your team every day? And maybe that's a measure that then gives you that login streak or that people streak or whatever karma that you attach to that. Right, so they want to encourage the things you should be doing more of. But yes, there are actually people who live by the login streak. Now, they also have a great messaging system, which applies to me most of the time. I'm, I live partly in Sweden. I speak no word of Swedish. I have seven other languages, just not Swedish. <laughs> and, you know, I'm learning with Duolingo to, to speak a bit of Swedish. But on, after two or three days, it starts saying, hey, we're missing you and sends me emails. Of, after two weeks, the messaging tone has changed to, I take it you're no longer interested in learning. We'll stop bothering you. <laughs> you know, and that usually, actually, that message usually gets me logging in again. Whereas the missing, you're always like, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> you know, we should really. You know, my, my fitness tracker also tells me, you told me three days was a good day to remind you to go and do some exercise. And guess what? Sometimes I do because it reminds me and sometimes I say, yeah, not today because I have no time. But, you know, it's those things, those little nudges to keep doing what you intend to do is what drives a lot of our behavior. It's no surprise that the people behind nudge theory actually have won a Nobel Peace Prize or a Nobel Prize uh, around behavioral economics. So nudge people towards what you want them to do. So... <clears throat> Obstacles can often give very good storylines, good scenarios. So in the case of a, a leadership game, you could have battling the obstacles of inboxes full, targeting the different parts of the organization that could potentially hijack your process. So you can make a whole fantastic story out of that. Then the tactic one, is the tactic we already have. We know that they are required learners. I said, in reality, we do this through observation, surveys, employee engagement, questionnaires, feedback uh, mechanics, etc. but also through workshops and pilot testing. From my change management consulting days, I know that if I actually get the project teams and groups of the target audience engaged in creating the new process, the chance of taking it up is a lot higher and the chance of it sticking because they've been part of making the solution is also a lot higher. So 
give yourself the chance to get first-hand input. So today we took the shortcut with the card. Now, I need someone on this table. Can you quickly come and pick one of these? If you're running, running close to time, so this is speed, speed gamification. So we want a real-time strategy game. So these are the types of games. There is 13 different cards around types of games. So we're going to make a real-time strategy game. Right. From that table, somebody quickly run to me. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Right, pick one. Awesome. Perfect. The win condition is that there is a winner and a survival in the game. So those that don't complete, a little bit like the adventure race you see on television, some people will complete, some people won't. You survive or you don't survive. So there's a survival race. So already an interesting experience. And then typically, I get people to add in more game mechanics. Now, the game mechanics is what makes the games fun. I also say every card is worth 10,000 pounds or $10,000. The more game mechanics, the more complex, the more budget. Right? <laughs> so if you have big budget, Take as many cards as you want. If you want to keep it real, take a few. And for your first one, take a few. Start with a pilot, start small, and implement those. So the lady with the problem, you have earned this deck, so come see me after. For the rest of us, I want to share, so the second tactic is what will enable them to win, so we have win conditions. We want to give them feedback, and we want to decide where in the process does the feedback show up. Is it a login streak? Is it a message? Is it a nudge? Feedback is the key to growth. You can use several tools and systems. I will put this, the presentation on SlideShare so you can actually download it from there later. So <laughs> I see lots of people frantically taking pictures. So. Uh, so feedback is key in all of us. The reason why games are so popular is because we get instant feedback of rights and wrongs. Uh, in work, we usually have to wait six months before we get the real clangor of, wow, your, your, your performance is really not so good. When really, if we could have it in the moment when we're doing it, we can change it, right? Good games have storylines. If you want to get better at making games and gamification, play lots of games. Good tip, right? <laughs> Who doesn't want to do that? And where possible, co-create. Get your people involved. Get them to work together to design the solution. You'll be surprised at what comes out of your teams. Every time I do it with organizations, people say to me, wow, I didn't know this was possible. Always reinforce what you want more of. And understand that right first time and forever is an illusion. So you will have to tweak your gameplay a little bit like advertising campaigns. They're seasonal. They have themes. They have reasons to exist. You start thinking about gamification strategies the same way. And you know, who can I contest with? Einstein said that play is the highest form of research. So and he invented an awful lot of great stuff. So I'm not going to argue with the great man. Thank you for listening. And you can find me at Gamification Nash or Gamification Nation. Love to talk to you. That's all. Mm -hmm.